Amen. All right, without further ado, um, today we have our my dad, sen senior pastor of this church. Growing up, I've never, in my teens, never really liked him. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. While I have the mic, <laughs> I'm still in charge. <laughs> uh, he's not going to give the mic back to me after this. <laughs> well, you know, like I'm sure all of you are the same. When you were in your teens and your, when you were kids, you never liked discipline if your dad disciplined you. Um, but then you grow into your 20s and then you slowly, you become a dad or you know, you grow, you start to work and you begin to understand them, don't you? You understand them. And then you go into your 30s, then you start to respect them, isn't it? You, I don't know what 40s will be, but haven't reached there yet, we'll see. <laughs> Almost there, but not quite there. But yes, um, looking back, I can see all the work that he has done. I um, understand now why he has gone through what he did. And I respect for him for all the things that he has achieved throughout his um, ministerial career and the, all the sacrifices he made. Um, some of the sacrifices included us as a family as well. We had to go on um, to do his ministry, but God still took care of us. Amen? Amen. Let's put our hands together and welcome my dad. <laughs> Don't worry, I don't take revenge. I'll tell you why. <laughs> Just want to take this opportunity to welcome Hannah's sister, Deborah, and Victor, her husband. Yeah, welcome. These are the bunch of goats we have. So we look after goats that turn into sheep. Amen. How many of you know it? it's possible? Amen? It's possible to turn goats into sheep, right? <laughs> Not sheep into goats, but worse still is when your sheep turn into wolves. Ah, that'll be even worse than that. But I'm glad that we, we settle down and just to honor God and worship God. And, you know, one of the beautiful things is uh, it's not about attending church. I'm going to say that and say that a few times. It's not about attending church. Is about encountering Jesus in the house of God together. We come to church to worship Him and to encounter Jesus together. Because that's what the Bible says. Don't forget the gathering of the saints. People always think this is what the pastor wants, the people to come to church. No, this is not what the pastor wants. This is what the church, that's what Jesus said. Don't forget the gathering of the saints. That's what the author of Hebrews says that. And it's important, we need to ask the question, why? Why do we need to come to the house of the Lord? Because, simply because we are here to encounter Jesus. But if you are here to fulfill a ritual, if you are here to fulfill an attendance, an attendance is not what God is going to mark down and, and tell you, hey, yep, I saw you here the other day. No. It's not a tendon. It's about encountering Jesus. And because of that, I'm going to say to you, come to church early. <laughs> Are you with me? Come to church early. Come to church and, min and be ministered by the presence of God. And, and so we want you to be in God's house to worship the Lord. And Sean said about in life we have the bad, the good, and so forth. Yes, I must say to you, it is the reality while your feet is on earth. There will be good times, there will be challenges, undeniably, because we are physically constrained. We are time constrained, and that's why we have a lot of challenges and pressures and tension because of time. There is no time in heaven because that's eternity. Time has been given unto earth. People who live here on earth are constrained with time. And therefore, we need to live with time. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. However, I want to say this, that life is filled with challenges. 
challenges that sometimes test our resilience. And sometimes we go through moments, moments where take the breath away from us. Sometimes we have opportunities that pushes us to grow. That's what the church is all about. And the problem is that we face in our everyday event, we see people make conclusion of what already happened. Something bad and suddenly they say, that's it. They made a conclusion to the matter. And we face a wide range of bad experiences that signify some significant impact on our emotion, on our physical body, and also our psychological mind. It affects our whole being. It also affects our the quality of life every day we go about. We do have bad challenges. But today I want to talk about God meant it for good. No matter what you go through, as long as you are willing to let God redefine your life. Too often time we go through the bad times and we allow it to happen and so we repeat, we repeat, we repeat. We never seem to stop repeating the wrong. And God wanted to redefine us, but we were not giving Him a chance to do that. So today I want to help you. In the story of life, God meant it for good because He can redefine your life. We go through chains of frustrating turns of events that led us to many or rather the hosts of raw questions such as how could we have been wrong? Didn't we hear correctly from God? Didn't we pray and we fostered? And so we went on and on with a lot of questions and then we began to say how is it that now we are sitting in debt financial debt, and also potential what we call hopelessness. How is it so that we are going about with no jobs and also seemingly without much of a future? Someone sent me an, a little short caption and I thought that would be appropriate to my sermon today. Let me quote. He says this, if moat gets bad, it becomes yogurt. Yogurt is more valuable than moat. If it gets worse, it turns to cheese. And cheese is more valuable than both moat and yogurt. And if grape juice turns sour, many of you who drinks, it transforms into wine, which is even more expensive than grape juice. So I thought to myself, yes, there are times certain things may turn bad, but it can become valuable when God redefines it. Are you with me? Amen. Unexpected turns oftentimes reshape our perspectives and also recreate a new path for all of us. Christopher Columbus made a navigational error that made him discover America out of that era. Alexander Fleming's mistake led him to a point to invent penicillin. Penicillin simply treat infection that causes by bacteria. You see, some of these inventions came about through mistakes. And I want you to know that not all bad experiences should always be defined as hopeless unless we allow God to use it and he will turn it good and redefine your life. So therefore, it is important that it must prompt you to reevaluate what is truly important to you today. I like what this guy, Robert Louis Stevenson, he's a, he's a poet, he's a writer. Uh, perhaps you may be familiar with his uh, books, Treasure Island. Some of you may have read it a long time ago. Uh, another book that he wrote, Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Hyde. And so, this man, 
made a statement and I, and I believe this statement is profound enough for you to grasp what I'm going to say today. He says, don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. Say it one more time. Think about it. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. Don't judge the results, but judge on the basis what you sown before you produce that result. What did you sow? That is the one that we should be looking at. It's not the result. Wow, look at this. This is beautiful. But then we need to know what we have sown in. Sometimes you get a bad result. We need to, we should not judge the bad results, but we should judge on the basis of what we actually sown. You see, a lot of time, can I say this to families? You see, you never know how your kid's going to grow up. But what you sow today is going to determine how your children will grow up one day. Are you with me? You don't believe me? Let your children grow up to a teenager and I can guarantee you what he is now is because what you have sown. Are you there? Some of you dare not say yes, huh? Yeah? Don't worry, I saw your kids. I saw them grow up from a very young age right up to where they are today. Even bigger than I am. And I could see and I could tell you the mindset of each of, their ch of your kids is because of what you have sown. And you know what? I want to help them that God meant it for good because He's going to redefine their lives. Are you with me? That's what we, we, we're going to do this very day itself. So I have a man here in this scripture, I have a man here who fits into all that I'm going to say. The bad times that he went through, the experiences that he went through, and his name is none other than Joseph in the book of Genesis. You see, in the book of Genesis, creation was given only two chapters. Noah, famous guy, whose name was mentioned in four chapters. But for Joseph, there were 13 chapters all about Joseph. It shows how important this man is. And within his story, there is a key text that you must not forget. It's found in Genesis 50 verse 20. And this is what it says. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of of many lives. That was the key text. And that fits in to what I'm going to say today. God meant it for good because He redefined Joseph's life. Let's look at Joseph for a moment. This particular story, 13 chapters all about him, is so full of political intrigue. It's so full of, of siblings rivalry. And it's also full of uh, love and hate and jealousy and, and compassion. And also at the same time, there is lust and ambition. And there is heroism and pitifulness. But at the end of this whole entire 13 chapters, I could literally see that God was working in Joseph's life. And I could summarize his life from pits right up to palace. That was all about him. From the pit to the palace. Well, in order to know that story, we must understand who Joseph is. Now, he is a spoiled brat, by the way. How many of you in the family have one spoiled brat in the house? All right, I could see the horse's hands all coming up. <laughs> There's always one spoiled brat, isn't it? But who is that spoiled brat? That spoiled brat who is Joseph, who he's narcissistic, okay? It's all about himself. And this man is insensitive. He's ins insensitive to the feelings of his own siblings. One day he brag about his dream. 
He talked about his dream. He said there was a day when we were all gathering the wheat in the field. And all of a sudden, my bundle stood up. And all of you, the rest of your bundle, went around me in a circle and bowed down to it. It's like a boxer trying to provoke the opponent. That's exactly how Joseph is. All right? In the home, I know that some of you provoke each other. Am I right or not? And you could be that narcissistic guy. <laughs> and the problem with Joseph is not only that. He doesn't know how to keep his mouth shut. He went on to tell the entire family of another dream. He says there was the sun and the moon and 11 stars. All bow down to him. You see, narcissistic guy just do not know how to keep his mouth shut. They talk and they brag. Yep, I heard baby's voice speaking a lot about herself. <laughs> Joseph's life seems to be out of control. He was never sensitive and he doesn't know how to keep his dream until the time is right. Even though it's God's dream. You see, Joseph is not a bad kid, by the way. He loves the Lord. He has been trained well. He's a favorite child. Now, by the way, any family always have a favorite child. You will cause others to be jealous. Okay? So you never treat anyone favorite. You treat everyone the same. Somebody said? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Only three people and the rest of the hostel never say anything. Need to be prayed for afterwards. Somebody say, hey. Amen. Amen. Okay, more people now saying about that. <laughs> and here Joseph was given a colorful coat. He started to prance around. He started to skip and dance and so forth. And the brothers hated him. That's quite obvious, isn't it? The brothers hated him. They couldn't stand him, let alone talk to him. They won't because he is annoying. I'm sure if I use those words, somebody is going to lift up their hand and point finger on the other side. There's annoying siblings beside me. But God is still operating in Joseph's life. He's working out his plan. He's working out his will upon him. You, you must understand, a lot of time when God is working, you and I can't see. When my children were growing up, I can't see what God is doing. But all I could see is God's assuring me. Are you there with me? God assures us that He is looking after our children. But He did not show me what He was doing. So we need to live with that very carefully because God is working His ways in Joseph's life. And one day, the father told Joseph, go over to Shechem to check on your brothers. And so he went, prancing, skipping, and dancing with his colorful coat. But then he realized the brothers were all in Dothan. And as he was going towards Dothan, the brothers could see him at a distance because of his colorful coat. And he's skipping around. And here they were saying, there you go. Look at this guy, this rascal. You know what we're going to do? We're going to kill him. The spirit of Cain killing Abel is still within the family. I want to kill him. And so as he was approached, of course, thank God for a brother by the name of Judah who says, no, 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 why not? We throw him to the pit and then we sell him to the, slave, to the slave traders. We sell him to the Midianites. And so they did. For 20 shekels, I did my research, it's approximately $216.25 US dollars. That's how cheap Joseph was. It was that time. And so they were selling him to the Midianites and they were going to Egypt and sold him to a man, the, one of the official commander of Pharaoh called Potiphar. And, though, 
as you can imagine with me right now, this man chained and been sold as a slave to Potiphar. But the Bible says, Whatever he was asked to do and he was asked to attend to, God began to bless him. How many of you know, no matter what your circumstances may be, as long as you are still honoring God in your heart, God is going to show himself through you, no matter what your bad experiences that you may have. And God did that. And manifest, and I want you to know God is involved in Joseph's life actively. He's working out something, he's redefining his this man's life. Though he was a slave, the Bible says the Lord did not abandon him. Potiphar was excited to see that everything he touches, God bless. How many of you know when you have somebody that is so blessed by God, you want him to be part of your partner? Are you with me? Right? And we want them to be partners because the Lord is blessing the person. But do you know that even when the favor of God came upon Joseph, he was not exempted from any further challenges? Ah, that's not one thing we all Christians like, isn't it? Huh? We like everything smooth. Smooth. Bed of roses. I only know the bed of roses is always placed in the graveyard. <laughs> bed of roses. We want that to happen. And so, now Potiphar's wife came into the picture. She got excited with this young, handsome-looking Joseph. And so Potiphar's wife trying to seduce him, which we read a lot of news today. Seduction in the body of Christ. This is true. And so Potiphar's wife trying to seduce and trying to embrace him, advance make her advancement towards him and try to kiss him. But he pushes us away because he had a fear of God and he pushed us away. But God, but Potiphar's wife somehow grabbed hold of something, his part of his garment or part of his, his little cloth that he had. And, and so he, she pulled it off from him. And she was very angry because she was rejected. And she uses these as the evidence. Alleged, allegedly accused him of him trying to rape her. And because of that, he was placed in the dungeon. She meant it evil, but God is going to mend it for good because he's going to redefine Joseph's life. God is about to redefine because he's actively working in Joseph's life. Right now, he is in the pit. So I want to say this to you. Firstly, never allow the pit to define your life. Never allow the pit to define your life. Why is it so? Because God is working in him. God is working in Joseph that there is that moment that he has with God in the pit itself. When I say the word moment, I'm talking about a non-permanent situation. It's a moment with God because God is transforming him and reshaping him. That moment, God is just chilling, chiseling him out of that situation so that he may know God's plan for his life. God was placing him in that moment. The hardship, the wickedness, and also the alleged, the, the, the accusation, 
the difficult past, the losses he had, the unfulfilled dreams that he's having, they are not meant to be a judgment. It was meant to be an invitation for him to come to the very heartbeat of the Father and know what God is doing in that moment. God is just doing something that you and I could not see. You see, Joseph needed to have the pit experience in order to prepare him for an assignment from God. That pit was a preparation. Sometimes we do not know that God was preparing you while you are in this pit experience. But while he was there, while God is just doing all that moment that he needs to do in Joseph's life, somehow the Lord showed that God was with Joseph. He gained favor with the warden while he was in prison. So the warden decided to let him in charge of all the rest of the prisoners while he's ministering to them. And guess what? That one day, one morning, Joseph came. He noticed there was a cupbearer, the king's cupbearer, and the king's baker were thrown in. They were thrown into the prison just about that day. And so Joseph noticed that one morning, their face looks like hopeless face. They are going to die. And then he was asking them the question. So they said, we both had a dream. And then they began to describe the dream. And here Joseph, not only a dreamer, but also an interpreter of dreams. Wow, that was a special gift. And so he interpreted the dream and he mentioned about the cupbearer will be brought back restored unto the position and he will be saved while the baker will be executed. And through enough, true enough, three days later, Joseph's interpretation came through and the cupbearer was restored to the original position as a cupbearer and the baker was executed. But the problem is this. Genesis 40 verse 23 says, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. You know, one of the most frustrating things is when you do a favor for people and people forget about you. Isn't it true? You have done so much and yet people forgot about it. And that is exactly how Joseph felt. I could imagine Joseph wishing that this, this is not the way the story is supposed to go. No, 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 no. Lord, I, I think you didn't hear correctly. I, I did everything I could. He wished he could have said that. I, I, I believe, God, you, you, you forgot about something. You, you need to get me out of this prison. No, he didn't pray that. He didn't pray that. I'll tell you why. Because the next thing is this. You never define your life with your delays. You never define your life with your delays. And listen very carefully. In God's timing and God's intervention, they are very important to us. Therefore, in, his, in God's timing and God's intervention, there is no such thing as delay. Because God doesn't have the kind of time that you have here on earth. A thousand days is a one day to Him. Remember that. So he, he doesn't have the definition of the time that you and I have. So as far as God's timing and God's intervention, there is no such thing as delay. And you must understand, God gave each one of us a destiny. Watch this. He gave us a destiny. And in that destiny, the time is attached to it. Okay? Time is attached to it. That's why we always tell people, live your time wisely. Use your time wisely. Don't be foolish. 
Don't abuse your time. Don't waste your time. Live your time rightly. Why? Because you are reaching your destiny that God has given to you. So through the passage from where you are, right up to the destiny, there is the timeline. The problem is, the enemy wants you to not reach your destiny. He wants to stop you and disrupt you from reaching your destiny. So what does he do? He comes in between and spoil your time. That's what he does. We are not to be defined by the delay because in God, His time is perfect. We have to be very careful because this particular area underscores the theme of divine timing. So about two years later, oh, two years in prison, two years later the Bible says this. He says, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, had two dreams that he did not understand. He couldn't understand. He had a dream of seven fat cows and seven thin cows. And later on, he had another dream of seven healthy heads of grain and seven heads of grain scorched by the sun. We all have our delays, my friend. We all have our delays. And we have to wait until the opportunity comes. You know what? Some of us have had your experiences of delays. We have delays in marriages. We have delays in conception, getting pregnant. Some take seven, eight, nine, ten years. We have delays in terms of uh, employment. Sometimes we have delays in terms of promotion. And not only that, we also have delays in terms of healing. Isn't it? You know, some, sometimes I feel that when you ask people to pray for you, sometimes we feel that they are not ready for healing. Have you, have, you, have you ever prayed for someone and you don't even hear an amen? You, they, they already have doubt. You see, please understand, when you ask somebody to pray, it's not a ritual exercise. When people pray, they pray to believe. And you need to come alongside and believe that. Are you with me? You want to see miracle? That's how it's going to happen. So sometimes we have a delay in healing. Remember the woman who bled for 12 years? Wow. And then John chapter 5 tells me about this lame man who had been lame for 38 years. He went to Podesta to this particular pool waiting to see that angel will stir the pool and he, he didn't have the opportunity to jump in. For 38 years, and all he had was one encounter with Jesus. Can I say that one more time? One encounter with Jesus. And that stops the delay. And sometimes you and I need that one encounter with Jesus. Isn't it true? It, it, that's why we need to come to church, have a gathering of faith within the body of Christ. And then when you have the vibe of faith in the body of Christ, you can sense the vibrancy and the dynamics of God's grace and power working inside. I pray today that you will experience what Joseph experienced. Suddenly, Pharaoh's dreams came. The rest of his magicians could not interpret. And Pharaoh became so desperate. And it's because of that, that's when the cupbearer remembered Joseph. Yeah? Cupbearer. How many of you know, no matter how long it takes, God still remembers. Amen? No matter how long it takes. So the forgetfulness of the cupbearer has set up the stage for Joseph to rise up in power when he had the opportunity to interpret the dream. But there's something I want to help you to see this whole entire event. Because we always think, why, don't, why didn't the cupbearer remember that earlier? 
And how is it that Joseph had to be in the dungeon for two solid years? Because the Bible says two years later. So it indicated very clearly that he was there two years. And, and, and listen to this. Charles Swindle said something like that. He said that sometimes God's appointment is not announced in advance. God's appointment is not announced in advance. And when I read that and I pondered through and I realized, hey, it was necessary for Joseph to function in the small place like the dungeon, the pit. It's important that he function himself with God, serve the Lord, honor God, engage with God while he was in these small places before he gets into the platform of greatness. There is a need for you and I to function in our small places. My ministry started to move forward when I function in my own personal closet. It's not about all the invitation that I have. It's not about the churches that I minister to. It's about the closet that I was in all by myself. That's when it starts. That's when the cry and the tears and the beating of the chest in the closet while praying. It was the function at the small places before God placed you in the bigger place. Because if you can't engage and serve God faithfully in the small role of our time, we can never function in any, anywhere bigger than what we have. So that was the place where Joseph was humbled and he became wiser. I'll tell you how is it so. Look at the conversation that Joseph had with Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh said this. He said in Genesis 14 verse 15, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And you know what Joseph replied? Listen, in verse 16, the next verse, I cannot do it, but God will. Have Pharaoh the answer, to give Pharaoh the answers he desires. I can't, but God will. You remember in the earlier time, Joseph was narcissistic. He said about his dream that everyone will bow before him. He was self-centered, like some Christians today. Everything is about me. I want to have a bigger church for my name's sake. It's all about me. This is where the problem is. If there will be ministers to listen, listen well. It's not about us, ministers. It's about Jesus. We raise the church for His glory. It's not about us who have achieved the dreams. So what? It's not about the dream that we achieve. That's where God is leading us to the next part of Joseph's life. You see, we never understand that God is showing Joseph now who is a wiser man that brought about the revelation to him that saves the nation. He interpreted the dream. And so the dream came about and was fulfilled. Pharaoh was very impressed with him and put him in the high position, very, just next to Pharaoh, like a prime minister. And since the day he was sold as a slave until now as a prime minister, there was 13 years past. 13 years. And now with this seven years of Great harvest and seven years of famine begin to take place. And one day, 
we could see from the dungeon and right up to Pharaoh's court when he has achieved that position. And now God is going to show him the final part, the final lap of his life. His family members came from, from where they were to Egypt to buy some food. And Joseph saw them. So the next part of Joseph's life is that never define your life with revenge, but define your life by God's intention. I said it one more time. Never define your life with revenge, but define your life with God's intention. The family members came wanting to buy food. Here Joseph recognized every single one of them except one brother of his was not there. His name is Benjamin. So Joseph began to talk to them and created a conversation as though the, the Egyptians were suspicious of these Hebrew kids or Hebrew people being a spy to the land. And they were trying to convince this Joseph, whom he, they do not know it was their long lost brother. And they were trying to defend and trying to convince him. And finally Joseph said, if you want to assure me and convince me, you said you got a younger brother, Benjamin, at home. Bring him over the next round. Bring him over to the next, to me, next trip. And so, yes, they did. The second trip they came, they came and buy the food and they brought Benjamin to him. And when Benjamin came, he saw his younger brother, but he already prepared to get his people to put a silver cup into Benjamin's back so that he can get Benjamin to stay with him. And when he is caught, he will be forced to stay with Joseph. So that was his plan. And so they did. Everything was done. They caught Benjamin and the brothers were desperate because the father Jacob told them, you must bring Benjamin back. And they assured the father, yes, we will bring him back. And now they are in danger. So they went to Joseph and pleaded, please don't. They were desperate. Joseph saw the whole event and he was moved in his heart. He told the people in that room to get out. And so it was left between him and the brothers. And he said this to them. I am your brother, Joseph. And you, you must understand, Joseph has been in God's waiting room for a long time for this opportunity to come by. Life was never defined by revenge. Lie was defined by God's intention. Joseph managed to put the past behind him. I pray if there's anyone here in this room that you have a past that will instigate you to take some revenge, I urge you, cease and stop. Because Joseph had taught us that he forgave them. And so he spoke to them in Genesis 45, verse 5 to 8. I want you to Verse 5 to 8, I want you to see that scripture. He says, Do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land and for the next five years there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by the great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. I said it one more time. So then it was not you who sent me here, it was God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. 
It was God who sent me. It was God who saved and broke the chains. It was God that helped me to see beyond my past. It was God who unraveled his intention. His intention was to save the remnant. His intention was to save lives. And we have been brought ahead. Ahead of every other people. For one intention is to save the lives of our family members and friends. Joseph knew the intention. Some of you here may not even appreciate what God is doing. You thought your life here in Australia was just because you have been given a migration ticket to come. But little do you realize this migration is about saving lives. Joseph came to help his brothers to battle the crippling shame by taking hold of the promises of the future where grace and mercy and peace been extended to them. Brothers and sisters, vengeance was never in God's mind, uh, was never in Joseph's mind. It was said in Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me but God intended for good. And it was spelled out, that is to save lives. Why is this possible? Because Joseph recognizes that he was placed in Egypt just simply to fulfill the intention of God to save lives. God's ultimate intention, my dear brothers and sisters, is to help redeem people for himself with whom he dwells amongst them and with whom he will share his glory with. You are placed here ahead of others simply to save lives. We are not here simply because we are given the migration ticket that most of us are here. But we are given this migration ticket was simply to save lives lives your children's lives your grandchildren's lives your friends lives your family's lives yes joseph's life may seem as though he has made so many errors and wrong turns so it seems but they are not they were necessary turns to get him to just the right place at just the right time. I believe I was not sent here by anybody else except God himself. I believe that we are sent here for a reason. To be honest with you, there are many people who live in the country that I live with, in Malaysia, do not realize that we were groomed up in Malaysia and to be brought into this land with the power of that faith to reach out to lives. I believe that God's intention is now unveiled for Joseph to see that he came ahead of his brothers to save their lives. I believe God's intention that is defined my life here simply for one is to bring people back to God. God meant it for good because He can redefine our lives to fulfill His intention to bring greater glory to His name. Let nothing bad define your life, my brothers and sisters. God has given us that life and He has given us the life with power to define our lives. You know, I'm glad that my God created each one of us on purpose, for His purpose and with His purpose. I pray today that you will understand that none of us here are created without any purpose. Can, 
I wish I could bring the kids here and line them up before you. And you, those of you who are parents, will look at your own children. Don't look at other kids. Just look at your own children. And then you begin to ask yourself, your child, does he or she live under the shadow of God's divine purpose over him or her? Did you see that? Or did you just see they are just children? Some of us would say there will be children that will fill up the seeds. Is that all? Is that all that we want to see our children fill up the seeds? Or do we see our children with the divine purpose of God in their lives that will be raised up, groomed up, mold and chiseled to the shape that will fit into God's divine mold for their individual lives, that they become what God wants them to become. I don't know about you, but that's the way it is. That's the way we pray for our little kids when they were young. That's the way we pray that our kids will achieve not only their dreams, but they will be the right kind of people. They will be a, a child that is groomed up to be a blessing to the citizen. That was what we prayed. Because I believe that's the legacy that all of us must have. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. <laughs> you know, when I saw the word work, that God is working, I realized that one day Miles Monroe was saying about the work. And uh, when he went into Genesis chapter 2, when he talks about the work, he studied the Hebrew word for work, W-O-R-K. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And a lot of you here will be thinking about work means you do your work, right? With your hands, with your body, right? But he found out in the Hebrew word, he studied, he said he studied for 12 years. I, I, wow. He need to study that one word for 12 years. That's, that's, that's fantastic, isn't it? And he said that word which intrigued me. He said the word, Work simply means to become. To become. When God gave you a work, He gave you a work according to what you become. And that was what He's saying. It's not just about a work, it's about you becoming. Are you there with me? You, when God gave us a work, we are working to become the person that God wants to work in us. Somebody say amen. There's something here that we need to change that. A lot of us, we are working very hard to earn a living. Fantastic. God bless you. Go ahead with that. But don't miss out while you are working. God is actually calling you to become what he wants you to become. And a lot of people miss that out because they never reach the place of their destiny or become what God wants them to become because they only focus on doing the work to earn a living. But they forgot it's not about earning a living. It's about becoming. And... and, and, and can, can I add something? Can I add something? Amen? I know it's a bit longer, right? Praise God. It's not that long. Not that long. I know, I know you're wonderful people. I, I, I like what Miles Monroe was saying one time, and I was just listening, and I just kept captivated by this, this wisdom that he brought up. He says about, in, in case some of you want to uh, get involved in relationship. Can I help you out? 
in case some of you think you can have a second relationship. <laughs> can I help you out as well? He said this. He said, God planted the man in the Garden of Eden. He planted the man in the Garden of Eden. To what? To work. He said that. Hey, to work. He didn't, he didn't, create, a, he didn't create a woman for you before he planted you into work. <laughs> so if you ever think of getting a boyfriend and girlfriend, you better start working first. Are you there? If you don't, don't work, don't think about boyfriend and girlfriend. Whoa, somebody say amen. <laughs> if you like that, give a nice stomping of your feet. Come on. <laughs> I thought I'd just add that in, right? It's not part of my sermon, but you know that. Just want to help some young people to realize, don't talk about boyfriend and girlfriend when, you, when your mother and father is still buying your suspenders. <laughs> and don't talk about relationship when you don't even know how to clean your room. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. I just want to hear a big amen to that. Isn't it true? Come on. How are you going to learn how? Oh, Lord, help me. Husbands, if you do not know how to keep your house clean, what, what kind of family is going, going to be? Oh, man. Somebody believe that I'm doing you a big favor? Say amen. amen. Okay, about six people I know. I could hear their voices. <laughs> but ultimately, ultimately, my question to you is that, do you know God's intention for you? Why God is doing what He's doing? You thought that you went through a bad time, but if you are willing to allow God to use the bad time and let Him make it good so that He can redefine your life. If you believe that's what you want, lift up your hands and say, yes, Pastor, that's what I want. If that's what you want, I want... I really want to pray, but before I pray with you, I want to say this. John chapter 13 verse 7 says something that is very profound. Jesus told his disciples, and I want to echo these same words to you. Listen to this. You don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. Amen. That's what he said in John chapter 13 verse 7. You never understand, but someday you will. So whatever you go through in that journey, there is a destiny right there that Joseph had to fulfill that dream. But while he was walking, there is this time zone that the enemy tried to disrupt so that he could not reach his destiny. Sometimes you do not need the enemy to disrupt the time zone. Sometimes our foolishness disrupts our own time zone. We never seem to listen. We never seem to understand why we need to walk and walk correctly and rightly within the time zone. That we will not abuse the time. That we will not waste the time. That something needs to be done. Amen. And when that is done, I believe we can reach our destiny. If somebody agree with me, say amen. Why don't you just stand to your feet right now in the name of Jesus. As we close in prayer, but before we do that, we give you this opportunity. Because I believe that each one of us has a destiny to fulfill. And no matter what you go through, if you were to open up yourself and allow God to turn those whole things, what seems bad experience to you, God can make it good because He can redefine your life. If you believe that, you know what I want you to do? I want you to take the step of faith and just be in the presence of God right here in this place and we just want to come alongside with you and pray. So I'm going to ask, is there anyone that says here, lift up your hand and say, Pastor, pray with me. 
That's all I'm asking. 